So, discovering the will of God, at the top of page 79, reading from the paragraph beginning, man is created in God's image and likeness. Man is created in God's image and likeness and is called to fullness of direct communing with God. All men, therefore, without exception, should be treading this way, but in fact experience shows that such is by no means a path for everyone. This is because most people neither hear nor understand God speaking in their hearts. They listen to the urging of passion, which inhabits the soul, and with its clamor, drowns the still small voice of God. It's an important point right there because, yes, we should be able to discern the voice of God in us, the voice of our conscience. And often we hear people, people living in the world, seculars saying something like, well, I, this is what I feel. This is what I feel is right. This is what I'm urged to do. So this line, they listen to the urging of passion, which inhabits the soul and with its clamor, drowns the still small voice of God, actually contains a very profound truth. It's not the voice of God or any higher voice that is being heard by people when they often say that they're inspired to do this or they feel that this is right. It's their passion. But they're not experienced enough to discern the passion from the genuine inspiration of God. And that is what the church helps us to, to do, to become more sensitive more aware of the presence of God in our lives and more sensitive to the voice of God in us so that we can discern his will. The last time that we talked about this, I had mentioned how Father Sophroni encouraged us to turn to God before doing, before saying, even before thinking anything get into the habit of turning one's heart and mind towards God as an anaphora, an anaphoral movement that brings about God's blessing and enables us to do what we do, say what we say, or even think what we think in a way that is blessed, in a way that is inspired and it sounds simple it's not so easy to do of course but once you get into the habit of it and you put it to the test you see that the results are much better than otherwise would be the case and thereby we become more sensitive more refined as images of Christ and of course then begins also a, a huge struggle because as we become more refined we notice things that we never used to notice before things trouble us that never used to trouble us before we're more sensitive and at times you look around you and you think my goodness me those people who don't believe in anything seem to have a better life than we do. We, we're suffering all the time. We're, we're sensitive. We're constantly wounded. Wounded by the, shall we say, the vulgarity of the world, the coarseness of the world, the lack of refinement of the world. And... You know, I wish I had a thick skin. I wish I could let it just run over me, pass over me like water off a duck's back. 
but we're constantly challenged, constantly challenged to respond according to the commandments and the example of Jesus Christ himself, which is the way of the cross. So there begins a, a struggle. But as we soon discover, this way is the only way that leads to salvation and those people who seemingly live a much more comfortable life are in fact unenviable in the end because they're aware neither that there is a God nor that there is an enemy and they're not aware that you know, there's a war taking place, a spiritual war that is taking place. So, Father Sofroni continues now to introduce to us, after he said what he said, which is a direct relationship with God and direct inspiration, discovering the will of God directly by being taught of God directly. He goes on to say that in the church, Another course lies open to us, to seek out and obey the counsels of a spiritual father. This is what the Staritz himself did, considering the humble path of obedience to be the most trustworthy of all. He firmly believed that because of the faith of the one who turned to him, the spiritual father's counsel would always be right, beneficial, pleasing to God. His confidence in the efficacy of the sacraments of the church and the grace of the priesthood were the more confirmed after one night in Lent on Old Rusikon during Evensong he saw the spiritual father Staritz Abraham transfigured, quote, in the image of Christ, unquote, and, quote, ineffably radiant, unquote. Filled with blessed faith, he lived the mysteries of the church in reality, but I remember he thought that on the psychological plane too, it was not difficult to see the advantage of obedience to a spiritual father. He used to say that when a father confessor answers a question in the performance of his ministry, he is at that moment untouched by the passion influencing his inquirer. And so he can see more clearly and is more easily accessible to the action of God's grace. A spiritual confessor's reply will usually bear the imprint of imperfection, but this is not because he lacks the grace of knowledge, but because perfection is beyond the strength and grasp of the one inquiring of him. Notwithstanding its inadequacy, the spiritual instruction, if accepted with faith and effectively heeded, will always lead to an increase of good. This process is often subverted because the inquirer, seeing before him an ordinary man, hesitates loses his faith a little and so does not accept the first word of his spiritual father and raises objections, putting forward his own opinions and doubts. And of course, once that enters into the conversation, that attitude enters into the conversation, then the conversation continues on a human level. It becomes a human interaction and it can be very pleasant, can be very nice, but it's no longer 
on the level of a, a mystery sacrament of the church. You see how important it is to accept the first word and not to question it or to doubt it and to begin to discuss. You just accept it and you keep it. And then God in his own time will reveal whatever is necessary for us to understand. If it's not given to us then to understand, it might be given to us later. So Staritz Siloan discussed this important matter with Higumen Archimandrite Misail, who died on the 22nd of January 1940, a spiritual man favored and manifestly blessed by God. Father Siloan asked the Higumen, how can a monk find out the divine will? He must accept my first word as the will of God, said the Higumen. Divine grace rests on him who does so, but if he resists me, then I, as a mere mortal, will back down. The idea behind Higumen Misail's reply is this. When asked for counsel, a spiritual father prays to God for understanding. But he answers in his capacity as man according to the measure of his faith. I believed and therefore have I spoken, wrote St. Paul. But we know in part and we prophesy in part. When a spiritual father gives advice or tells a man what to do, he himself is anxious not to sin and is on trial before God. The moment then that he meets with an objection or even some inner resistance on the part of his inquirer, he does not insist or presume to affirm that what he was saying was the expression of God's will. In his position as man, he withdraws. This conception, Igumen Misail expressed very clearly in his life. On one occasion, he summoned a novice, Father S, and laid a complicated, difficult task of obedience on him. The novice readily accepted and bowing low, moved to the door. On a sudden, the woman called him. The novice stopped. Lowering his head on his chest, the woman quietly but meaningfully said, Father S., remember, God does not judge twice. So when you do something in obedience to me, it is I who will be judged by God, but you will not be called to account. I happen to know that this was uh, an occasion when Igumen Misail asked Father Safroni to begin learning Greek. As you know, the monastery of St. Pantaleimon on the Holy Mountain is a Russian-speaking Athenite monastery. And at that time, they lost their liaison, the monk who was able to communicate on behalf of the monastery with the surrounding monasteries and skeets and authorities and so on in Greek. So he died, this person that had that job died and then Father Sophroni was chosen by Igumen Misail to do this task 
And uh, Father Sofroni readily accepted, but he realized that there would be a spiritual cost to this, this intellectual learning of a new language. And Father Sofroni said that he remembers the moment that he opened Greek grammar to begin studying Greek. He said his noose left his heart and focused on the book, fell on the book. That's how he described it. So being a spiritual man of discernment, Higum and Misail nevertheless recognized that although Father Sofroni had accepted the obedience readily, there was a certain sorrow in his heart because he understood what it meant what the cost would be spiritually. So he addressed that by saying, look, bear in mind that God does not judge twice. So when you do something in obedience to me, I will be judged, not, not you. And indeed, indeed, Father Sofroni found that to be the case because in obedience, so many gifts, so many blessings, so much protection, and the gift of prayer is given. So, Father Sofroni continues this description of this episode by saying that when anyone objected, even if only mildly, to some commission or instruction from Igumen Misail, that generally strong-minded, ascetic personality, in spite of his post as administrator, would usually reply, well, all right, do as you like, and did not repeat his injunction. And Staret Siloan, likewise, when he met with resistance, would fall silent. So, one of the scariest things that you could hear from your spiritual father is this word, or words to this effect, well, all right, do as you like. And then you should be possessed of fear and trembling because from that moment, you know, you're on your own and um, heading for a very painful lesson in life. Why is this so, Father Sofroni says? On the one hand, because the Spirit of God suffers neither violence nor argument. On the other, because the will of God is too great a matter to be contained or receive perfect expression in the words of a spiritual father. Only the man who accepts these words of his spiritual father with faith as being pleasing to God, who does not submit them to his own judgment or argue about them, has found the true path. For he genuinely believes that with God all things are possible. Now, one of the things that is truly a challenge to us today is this propensity that we have as modern human beings, to analyze just about everything we do, and subject it to our scrutiny and judgment. We often find it difficult to suspend our own analysis and just listen, just hear. You know, some people think that it's more correct to say, let us listen to the Holy Gospel. Actually, it's not. The words, let us hear the Holy Gospel. Hearing is free of this intellectual, analytical way of receiving. You know, we're constantly, our minds are spinning and turning and thinking and analyzing. We miss the point often. We miss the point because 
in our complexity, we lose the simplicity of what is taking place. So, and in fact, if you take a look, good text to, to read in this regard, Principles of Orthodox Asceticism by Father Soprani, where he discusses this question and this challenge that we have. It's so difficult to find someone in whom there is no guile. So, you know, we have the camera, as I've said before, we have it turned on ourselves now. We analyze everything, including, or maybe even especially, ourselves. And it's interesting that when you... We've spoken many times about the benefits of meeting and receiving the blessing from holy men and women, saints. What you have to do when you are there in their presence is a kind of self-emptying. You have to empty yourself of your own thoughts, lay aside all your cares, as the Cherubic hymn says, and just, just be there, just be present, open to receiving whatever God wills to give. That is a movement, that is a motion, that is a, a disposition that is required of us when approaching God, the people and things of God. And so, Father Sofroni concludes with this line, this is the way of faith discerned and confirmed in the millennial experience of the church. It wasn't so long ago when uh, frequent communion was a rarity. It wasn't so long ago that our people from Orthodox countries were not really practicing confession and the mystery of spiritual fatherhood, the spiritual father and child relationship was all but unknown to the vast majority. And you see how important these things are, how central they are. And that signifies a certain revival, but it also signifies a certain challenge because the folks that used to receive, let's say, you know, the classic formula used to be for a long time, four times a year after each of the major fasts. And then with frequent communion, of course, the emphasis was that doesn't mean that you water down the spiritual life. In fact, the spiritual ascetic life is and should always be the context of, of receiving Holy Communion, of living and benefiting from the mysteries of the Church. We've seen things go in certain directions. An emphasis on the sacraments emerged, which was devoid of the ascetic context that somehow everything takes place when you're in church. And then outside of church, what about the before and the after? And now, with God's help, I think people are more aware, but by no means all of our people, many of our people are still not aware of the ascetic context of the life of the church. You know, when you look at an icon and you see the name is written in a way that's difficult to read. And you say, now who's that saint, you know? And you look more closely and you, you say, ah, okay, okay, so it's Saint Sala or Nic Nicola, Nic oh. You know, and you, you make an effort. You have to make an effort. God wants us to make an effort when we approach God and the things of God, that's what he wants. 
He wants us to make an effort to show that we want him. What is easy and what is comfortable and all of that, that's not, that's not the Christian way. So almost everything we do is going against the culture that we have around us. We know that the millennial experience of the church. So to speak of these matters, says Father Sophroni, which constitute the unconcealed mystery of Christian life, yet surpass the bounds of our indolent everyday existence and generally limited spiritual experience, is never without risk because many may misunderstand and wrongly apply the message. And then, instead of good, harm may result, especially if the ascetic life is entered upon with prideful self-confidence. When the Staritz was approached for spiritual counsel, he was unwilling he would refuse to provide an answer of his own. He remembered St. Seraphim of Sarov's words, when I spoke my own idea, I made mistakes. Adding that the mistakes might be slight, but they could be grave. The spiritual state which he spoke of to Father Stratonikos, the perfect never say anything of themselves, they only say what the Spirit inspires them to say, is not always accorded even to those approaching perfection. Just as the apostles and the saints did not always work miracles and the spirit of prophecy did not operate in equal measure in the prophets, speaking out powerfully at times at others silent. The Staritz made a clear distinction between the word of experience and direct inspiration from on high, the word of the Spirit. The former is precious, but the latter loftier and more trustworthy. Sometimes he would voice the will of God definitely and with confidence, telling his inquirer that the will of God was that he should do thus and thus. At others, he would answer that he did not know God's will for him. He would say that sometimes the Lord does not disclose his will even to saints, because the one who approached them did so with a false and deceitful heart. Well, let's uh, come back to this difficult text afterwards.